Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Naveen Pemaraju. I'm professor of leukemia at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And it's really my great honor and privilege to be invited uh, by my friend and colleague, Dr. Gavorg Tamamian, who is one of the great leaders in the world in uh, pediatric uh, rare and uh, important blood cancers. And he's been my colleague along with our friend and colleague, Professor Marina Kanapleva, uh, who now is at Albert Einstein in New York. And together we are starting to pioneer a global consortium interested in particularly blastic plasma cytoid dendritic cell neoplasm or BPDCN, which has been my area of expertise over the last two decades. And so at his kind invitation, I'd like this uh, talk to serve as a primer or introduction to the field of BPDCN for all of those stakeholders involved all over the world for both pediatric and adult uh, uh, caregivers. And so with this, let us begin. Blastic plasmacytoid dendritic cell neoplasm. Yes, a very long name abbreviated as BPDCN. Essentially in one sentence, this is an ultra rare leukemia subtype, a bone marrow blood immune system cancer that has extraordinarily poor prognosis, one to one and a half years historically, and can affect multiple organs of the body, including most notably the skin, which marks it as different from the vast majority of hematologic malignancies. With this, it can actually affect all parts of the body. And so it represents a real hybrid between and among AML, ALL, lymphomas, and skin cancers. So BPDCN affects not only the skin and bone marrow, as I mentioned, but also the lymph nodes and even, unfortunately, a high rate of central nervous system involvement. With this, there's also a propensity for other extramedullary sites. And while there's no recurrent cytogenetic hallmark for BPCN, there is one important hallmark, which is that of CD123 overexpression. This is a surface marker, uh, also known as IL-3 receptor alpha, which is present on 100% of patients with BPDCN. In addition to CD123, we find that patients will have CD4, CD56, and that triplet should be present in approximately 90% of patients. And so we abbreviate it as THINK123456. While that's sensitive for BPDCN, it's not 100% specific, and we still need to differentiate this entity from AML with leukemia acutis and other related entities. And so the addition of the TCL4, TCF4, and TCL1, TCF4, and CD303 have given approximately 100% sensitivity and specificity. Now, although it's a hybrid disease in the clinic with lymph node involvement and leukemic involvement and skin involvement, Almost all of the molecular mutations that we see on routine next generation sequencing are that of myeloid. And you should recognize these. These are the ones that are seen in CMML, MDS, AML. By far, the most common mutation or variant is TET2, followed by ASX01, and then several other mutations, including RAS and splicing factor mutations. Outcomes, as I mentioned, are quite poor in this rare disease, less than two year overall survival, the historical expectation. And the only approved drug, which our group was able to lead to FDA approval in the U.S. in December 2018, was that of Tegraxafos, which is CD123 targeted therapy, with many other drugs now in clinical trials, including the IMG and 632 pivetumab, and I'll show you data on both of these in a moment. After all, BPDCN is a visual disease. I never thought in my life that I would be talking to dermatologists every day, and yet here we are. In this blood bone marrow immune system cancer that has a predilection for affecting the skin in almost all patients at some point in their disease course. I show you pictures from around the world with some of these. They can range from the maculopapular to all the way to very, very involved plaque-like tumor ball lesions. Most patients usually present in the clinic with a dark, almost purple color lesion, I would say is one of the more common presentations for BPDCN. Of course, in all um, instances, tissue diagnosis is a mandatory part of the assessment. When I think about BPDCN over time, not only is it a rare disease, but now that we're getting so many calls from all over the world, which led to this partnership between Gavorg and I, we're realizing that this disease was hiding in plain sight. And one of the problems was that the name has changed so many times. Take a look at this chart. Just two decades ago, it was known as blastic NK cell lymphoma, NK because of the CD56 expression. So it was mistakenly thought this was a natural killer cell derived disease. Then by 2005, with the recognition of the 4 and 56 positivity together, 
it was renamed. Then by 2008, it was given this long, unwieldy name, but at least placed under AML, acute myeloid leukemia, and family of neoplasms. 2016, yet again, WHO reclassification as its own unique myeloid malignancy. And then can you believe it once again in 2022, just last year, the most recent WHO fifth edition now places it yet again in its own category under uh, plasma cytoid diverticulum cell neoplasm. Importantly, it is vital to characterize and differentiate the BPDCN and Im immature PDC uh, malignancy from, uh, say, mature PDC proliferation, which can uh, be uh, found in either AML or CMML, for example, and not constitute the BPDCN entity. Okay, so BPDCN, rare disease, has changed names, appears to be a malignant neoplasm derived from precursor plasma cytoid endric cells, PDCs, fine. But how are these patients doing? As I mentioned, pretty poor survival. These are some of the European studies over time. What should stand out to you is that no matter what, you have a pretty low CR rate, around 40 to 50%. Most, most groups are giving multi-agent chemo, AML, ALL lymphoma. And then you have a super high, unacceptably high death rate because these patients really do poorly um, overall. And so with this median overall survival so low, the most common uh, issues are that patients can transform to an acute leukemia, usually AML, and or have infection, multi-organ failure, sepsis, early death. And so we need urgent therapies. Uh, our group and others have led the quest in this uh, seeking of new therapies. And this is a schematic or a cartoon of the BPDCN cells. Uh, the CD123 being a surface target, accessible appears to be a somewhat attractive therapeutic target. And so that's where the initial studies have been. And as we look around for other targets, the intracellular BCL2, bromo domain, NF kappa B, and other pathways have become attractive in the recent years. But the most data is in targeting CD123. This paper is now 20 plus years old, led by uh, our colleagues, Craig Jordan and Dr. Monica Guzman, which really reminds us that the IL-3 receptor alpha CD123 is actually commonly expressed and overexpressed throughout myeloid and lymphoid malignancies. Not only is it overexpressed on these PDCs, but also basophils, monocytes, eosinophils, uh, sort of throughout the hematopoietic system. The supposition here is that not only is this overexpressed in 100% of patients with BPDCN, but also the vast majority of patients with AML and at least half or more patients with MDS, CMML, MPNs, all throughout the system. Interestingly, almost all patients with hairy cell leukemia will have the expression of CD123. So as we think about BPDCN, a rare entity which is now gaining its own prominence, really the original studies in this area were conducted by my friend and colleague, Professor Art Frankel. And what Dr. Frankel did is he actually constructed in his lab the molecule, which was he took a truncated diphtheria toxin payload, fused it to a recombinant human IL-3 and created this DT-IL-3, later known as SL-401 to Raxifusbertag. Outside of testing for AML and MDS, in which it had limited, limited clinical activity as a single agent, it really found the home in patients with BPDCN based on both in vitro and in vivo data, really for the first time in our field, showing that a targeted agent worked in BPDCN. And so he and I and our group took this into the clinic in a pilot phase one study now a decade ago, and we found that the vast majority of patients in this small group uh, did respond. That's seven out of nine evaluable patients, the majority of whom had a complete remission. At the time, the majority of those patients only had one cycle of the drug, which was uh, approximately five doses, uh, just showing how limited it was at that time. But with this pilot signal, we were able to publish in Blood 10 years ago with a favorable editorial suggesting that this was the start of the targeted therapy era in BPDCN. So with that, um, I was able to take the leadership of this with my colleague, uh, Professor Marina Konopleva, and under the leadership and guidance of our chair, Professor Havob Kantarjian, in a small multi-group uh, experience, we were able to take this tag or tagraxifusp agent into a formal multi-center, multi-cycle prospective clinical trial. The first stage was conducted as a traditional three plus three with a dose finding starting at seven micrograms, escalating up to 12. We found great efficacy, but also some toxicity with the capillary leak syndrome. And so in stage two, we now identified the target dose of the TAG agent, 12 microgram per kilogram. It's an IV drug, first dose in the hospital, uh, usually given up to five doses every 21 to 28 days. 
And then stage three was a pivotal confirmatory focusing only on frontline patients and on CR. And uh, in terms of inclusion and exclusion criteria, most people usually gloss over this, but I can't do that in this new agent because there were two important factors that we noticed. One was the albumin or protein level mattered, the lower, the more rate of Kepler leak syndrome, and then heart and pulmonary function matter. So we did require uh, some baseline stability of those and an albumin of 3.2 or higher. The BPDCN disease was so rare that there was not yet a disease measurement scale. So we needed to create one. And so we put this forward that has worked well in our field. For the skin assessment, we borrowed from the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma M-SWAT that allows you to make the subjective objective. So I think any clinic around the world can use that. Bone marrow, of course, by AML, traditional assessment, and then lymph nodes, because that's common in BPDCN, traditional lymphoma assessment. So what I wanted to do was to at least borrow established elements from cutaneous, AML, a, uh, and then lymphoma. And so then we put that all together as one uh, common or overall BPDCN assessment. Before I show you the results of the Tagraxifusp experience, it's important to know that sometimes new drugs bring new toxicities. In the case of the TAG agent, there's nothing new about capillary leak syndrome or vascular leak syndrome. That's been around since the time of oncology and chemotherapy. In fact, the CLS can be found in and around transplant with cytotoxic agents elaborated by disease states themselves. But it is important to note because the capillary leak syndrome can be life-threatening. It can be lethal and it can happen within six to 12 hours. And if it's not mitigated, can lead to ICU death. Uh, it's a very important thing to note. So what we found with this agent is there's a couple of things that track with it. One is the baseline albumin. You have to have 3.2 or higher, and that should be without supplementation to get onto the drug. And once you're on the drug and you see a sharp kinetic decrease, that also may track with an increased rate of CLS. And so at that point, yes, you do need to supplement with albumin. And then watching the volume status oftentimes will give um, Lasix or other diuretics uh, if indicated. The body weight matters. If you have more than 1.5 kilogram weight gain or more in one 24 hour period, you need to hold the drug, diurese. And then sometimes in approximately 40 to 50% of patients, the LFTs can go up quite high in the first cycle. So you're watching all these. If the patient does develop the capillary leak syndrome, then immediate uh, high dose steroids can really mitigate. We've saved uh, quite a few lives by doing that. And then if you do need to transfer to the ICU, shock, you know, treat for sepsis just in case that's happening, antibiotics, now you're giving steroids, diuretics, vasopressors, whatever is necessary based on the individual pathophysiology. But many of these patients can be salvaged and actually be rechallenged with the drug because it appears to be usually a first dose, first cycle exposure response. One such patient of mine is featured here. We published this case a few years ago, a young patient who had massive capillary leak syndrome, which appeared to look like um, myocardial edema or an, even an infiltrative process with simple diuresis with ferrosamide Lasix and um, um, close monitoring was able to completely resolve this. The patient uh, quickly recovered and was able to be rechallenged with the Tagraxifus in multiple cycles, went on to alginate transplant, is alive and well four years later. So with this TAG agent, we were able to bring it to FDA approval in the U.S., now almost five years to the date here, so December of 2018. Uh, the drug trial was ultimately based on 47 patients, 29 of whom were frontline, the drug, as I mentioned to you, is a CD123 targeted agent, monotherapy, IV, first dose, first cycle should be given in the hospital. After that, up to you, outpatient versus inpatient. Overall response rate of 90%, so almost all patients responding, 72% CRCRC, and 67% of the relapse refractory setting. In addition to its FDA, US FDA approval, it was also approved for ages two and older, so pediatric patients included based on a limited case series from our colleagues at City of Hope. The drug uh, can lead to remarkable responses, including visually in the clinic. With, with the skin component, it's very satisfying to see that for you, for the patient, for the caregiver. One of my patients shown here, 71 years old, someone who you would not necessarily think would be fit for cytotoxic chemotherapy. Certainly, we did not want to give cytotoxic. We gave the TAG agent on the original trial complete response very quickly, sustained over multiple cycles, able to then go to an allergenic transplant. So sometimes patients' performance status actually can improve with these targeted agents. We then sought a European approval 
So the tag uh, data was reviewed by the EMA and it did gain uh, approval there, a bit more limited approval. That's January 2021, restricted to adults in the frontline setting only. Again, they appropriately noted the signal for the CLS capillary leak in approximately 18 to 20% of patients, usually in the first week, first cycle, can be manageable, potentially preventable uh, there. So um, I mentioned the first three stages in the New England Journal paper, the TAG experience, up to 47 patients, but we actually had a stage four as well and continued to enroll on an extended uh, basis. And so that actually led to a total of 65 total frontline treated patients, providing a wealth more of data uh, to, to look through. And so we were able to publish this in the long-term experience in the JCO last year. So this is now up to 65 frontline treated patients treated at the 12 microgram uh, FDA approved dose. And there were no new safety signals. The overall response rate remained quite high at 75% with a 57% CRCRC rate. And you can see here a tail to the curve with the overall survival uh, approximately 16 months in this longer term setting, many of the patients being successfully bridged to allo transplant. And so what we can conclude from this first part of the talk is that the TAG agent leads to high response rates it also leads to high rates of bridging to stem cell transplant, and that the capillary leak syndrome is common but manageable in the vast majority of patients, but because of its life-threatening potential nature, it carries what's called a U.S. FDA black box warning. And then the agent not only is approved in adults, but also ages two and older, and now is being investigated in a variety of myeloid and lymphoid malignancies in monotherapy and in combination. Well, we didn't stop there. We sought other agents, and so now we've been working together on the second generation CD123 agent, which is known as IMGN632 or Pavecumab Sunarine. The Pavecumab Sunarine agent has been initially tested in the relapse refractory BPDCN setting, 29 patients treated, showing a response rate of 29 to 31%, including in patients with prior tag exposure. This represents really the first time that we've prospectively done sequential CD123 therapy as almost always, the CD123 target is retained. It's not lost in the relapse refractory setting. Patients, uh, as I showed you with the TAG agent, had responses in all of the skin, you know, compartments, skin, bone marrow, and lymph nodes. So based on this relapse refractory uh, cohort, the US FDA gave it what's called a breakthrough therapy designation, and we moved into the frontline setting in clinical trials. In the frontline setting for the Pavecumab, I presented the phase two trial results ongoing, at the recent EHA meeting in Germany this summer. So let's take a look in more detail at the second generation CD123 agent, shall we? The Pivecumab Sunarine or PVEC is a little bit different mechanism of action than the TAG to Graxifos I showed you earlier. The PVEC represents a first in class ADC antibody drug conjugate, which has its own program. It has its own cleavable linker. It has a cytotoxic payload called IGN rather than the bacterial toxin I showed you earlier. And this IGN payload is a bit unique. It alkylates DNA, leads to single strand breaks without cross linking, and it has high potency against tumor cells. And in this case, we're directing it in the CD123 fashion. So, this uh, ongoing clinical trial that I've been leading with my group uh, does have sites in both the US and Europe. The Cadenza study, IMGN632801, has been an open label multi center phase two trial, both frontline and relapsed patients, as I mentioned. The dose of this interesting new agent is 0.045 mg per kg. It's an IV drug given Q3 weeks and can be administered even in the first cycle as an outpatient. All patients were encouraged to receive CNS prophylaxis, as we now understand it's so common in BPDCN. So among the uh, publicly available results now, this is 79 total treated patients, 30 of whom are in the front line. You can see the median age as older, uh, as you would expect with this historical cohort of BPDCN. Almost all patients are male. That's in keeping with the historical expectation. BPDCN is anywhere from three to one to five to one male predominant. There are some theories on that, including that there is a ZRSRF2 and other X, X chromosome-based mutations. Uh, you can see the proportion of disease, skin, bone marrow, nodal disease, and for the relapse refractory patients, as you let your eyes look over this slide, they are heavily pretreated. They've uh, half of them have had prior tag or intensive chemotherapy. A third have had prior transplant. So a heavily pretreated group for the relapse refractory. Safety of this novel agent, a very well tolerated drug overall, I would say, among these 79 patients. The most common AE that we saw was approximately half the patients with peripheral edema 
This is interesting and should be contrasted with the capillary leak syndrome, which is more of a central phenomenon. This is extremity peripheral edema, so lower and upper extremities, 46% of the patients uh, at all grades uh, managed um, uh, with diuretics. Uh, a quarter of the patients had thrombocytopenia, a quarter had fatigue, and a quarter did have an infusion-related reaction uh, on the day of dosing, which was mitigated with pre-medications with dexamethasone now given on the day before and the day of the IMGN infusion. Uh, there were a couple of notable but less frequent AEs, as I show you here. There were a few liver-related AEs, including uh, reversible VOD of all grades at 4%. Remarkably and amazingly, one of those patients actually proceeded to allogeneic stem cell transplant without any liver complications. There was hypoalbuminemia noted, although no capillary leak syndrome events reported. There were 3% discontinuations due to PVEC-related AEs and a 0% mortality in frontline patients at one month. So let's focus on the data from the frontline setting for the novel agent IMGN632. Uh, overall response rate quite high at 80% with a composite CR of 73%. And the time to first response, as you can see here, is quite quick with a median of 1.3 months for the overall response rate. And remarkably, a third of the patients were bridged to allogeneic stem cell transplant despite the older age, as I showed you. The duration of response in the frontline setting is shown here. The median DOR was uh, over a year at 12.7 months, which does include post-transplant durability and the median uh, DOCR, so duration of CR, was 10.3 months. Uh, in addition to those data, I wanted to show you a waterfall plot of the uh, bone marrow blast reduction. Uh, really, almost all patients who had uh, the drug did, and did have some sort of a response. And you can see here the bone marrow involvement, uh, almost all of these patients, uh, 11 out of 13 achieved an overall response. I mentioned BPDCN is a visual disease. What happened with the skin? Again, you saw not only bone marrow blasts, but also skin lesions and lymph nodes decrease. This is a 66-year-old man who had extensive skin disease at baseline, an m squat of 88.5, which went down to remission. This patient at age 66 was able to achieve a remission and go to stem cell transplant. So beyond these two agents, uh, our groups and others continue to explore and investigate targeting CD123. Uh, yet another approach might be CAR T cells. This is work led by Professor Konopleva and Dr. Guzman showing preclinical work that an allogeneic or off-the-shelf approach to targeting CD123 with CAR T cells might be beneficial. And we're working currently with the company for this that's known as Selectus. Uh, the trial is ongoing now in the relapse refractory AML setting. Beyond CD123, another uh, marker of interest is that of TET2, which is I think kind of unexpectedly uh, the most common mutation or variant in BPDCN. What's intriguing about the TET2 is that we recently uh, looked in our own database and published and found that the type of TET2 mutation apparently matters, that truncating mutations appear to be worse overall survival in BPDCN as compared to missense. I think more intriguing is the connections of TET2 with everything else. TET2 is obviously the common denominator between CHIP, MDS, CMML, and this BPDCN, and there's a lot of overlap with these. And so I think that is being further investigated. And then there's also implications with uh, a lot of BPDCN patients have sensitivity to hypomethylating agents. And then what are these implications as we go forward and as patients live longer uh, in terms of stem cell transplant and post-transplant monitoring? Our group further wanted to look at BPDCN at the cytokine level. And what we found is that once patients get steroids, cytotoxic chemo, CD123, BCL2, you name it, oftentimes the burden of disease rapidly reduces and they often feel better. And we think this can be in part explained by this, which is that cytokines such as eotaxin and rantes are significantly elevated in BPDCN, even compared to, say, a com control group of TET2 mutated AML, and that possibly this rapid hot cytokine milieu, which is then quickly reduced by steroids, chemo, CD123, BCL2, can account for this uh, uh, phenomenon. Furthermore, outside of these uh, markers I mentioned, the ZRSR2 story is quite important. This is my colleague, Dr. Andy Lane and Dana Farber, who led this study, which really show that these are really common in BBDCN, maybe up to a third of the patients having a splicing factor mutation, and this leads to an abnormal PDC program. And what's important is that this ZRSR2 is on the X chromosome, and so that could possibly maybe explain the male predominance in this disease. 
Furthermore, Dr. Lane's group has shown that UV light appears to play an important pathogenic role in shaping dendritic cell leukemia transformation, particularly obviously in the skin and this skin predominant disease, and that this then also is possibly more pronounced in TET2 uh, aberrant cells. And so, again, the concept of chip, older age, carcinogens such as smoking and UV light, all of these are starting to become possible uh, risk factors, if you will, for BPDCN when we didn't really think about any of these things five to 10 years ago. So more studies are needed to further look at these risk factors. Uh, other targets include BCL2, of course, with the popularity and, and exquisite uh, story of venetoclax from bench to bedside, even in our own BPDCN, not extrapolating, okay, from MDS, AML, and others, we have seen both in vitro and in vivo data that the venetoclax agent has activity. And so we sought to do a formal phase one clinical trial. Uh, the first two patients treated were older patients with relapse refractory disease with Venn monotherapy, and they had pronounced but transient responses um, uh, with the Venn monotherapy. And so the supposition is that like the other diseases, possibly combination will be beneficial. And so the first approach that we did was combine the metaclax with traditional ALL cytotoxic chemotherapy, which we found to be very effective in BPDCN prior to the CD123 era. And so we took the contorgen hypersevad ALL regimen combined it with VEN, and first three out of three patients all had very nice complete remissions, and all three were able to proceed to stem cell transplant. And so now we started to hypothesize a, a more total therapy approach, that combinatorial therapy upfront before the disease can relapse and have such a poor overall survival could lead to possible cures. The problem with that is the vast majority of our patients in the real world setting, and particularly all over the world, uh, many of you who will watch this will know exquisitely what I'm going to say, which is many of our patients are older, frail, comorbidities. There may be socioeconomic concerns, many of these CD123 and other agents not yet available. And so what about HMA VEN? That's something that's become standard around the world for older AML. So our group and others have looked at this as an experience combined with us and Mayo Clinic, and we found among uh, 10 patients who were 70 and older, all had some comorbidities precluding them from going on clinical trial or investigational approach, some form of HMA VEN, and all 10 had some form of response, mostly transient. But two of these unfit patients who were so unfit, couldn't go on a clinical trial up front, were able to go to an allogeneic stem cell transplant. So there is utility in the real world setting older unfit patients to use HMA VEN. But how do we put all this together? I think the future of the field is in total therapy, triplets, quadruplets, in such a, an aggressive refractory disease, um, meaning that like in multiple myeloma and AML, potentially using all of our best agents up front to prevent relapse in the first place. That's the hypothesis. So one trial is what we're doing here, which is the TAG AZA VEN experience, open at our center at MD Anderson, Dana-Farber and City of Hope, uh, and this has arms for both AML and um, actually AML, MDS, and BPDCN. And with some nice correlative studies, we hope to be able to offer this triplet uh, to patients. And this trial is open and enrolling at our center. But remember, I mentioned that BPDCN commonly has CNS involvement and that there should still be a role of ALL cytotoxic based chemotherapy. And we wanted to see why is that. I put together this slide for your review. There's a lot of reasons why ALL-based therapy works in this disease. I listed some of them here. Um, I think one that's interesting is that there are case reports of just steroid sensitivity or vinca alkaloid sensitivity alone, leading to oftentimes a transient but pronounced response. Uh, the CNS penetration, obviously, of methotrexate, ERA-C. Um, there is quite a few patients with BPDCN who are either TDT positive or AQ24 MICRI arrangement. So again, the supposition is that this has myeloid elements and lymphoid elements as a hybrid disease. Well, I mentioned the CNS signal. This is an extraordinarily new finding and a surprising one that has changed our practice. Uh, Dr. Contargen and I look back in our database at the Anderson among 100 patients, and to our surprise, 22% were found to be CSF positive at any time in their disease, and half of these were in the frontline setting. Almost all of these were occult asymptomatic because a lumbar puncture was done. When I did a multivariate analysis, interestingly and surprisingly, the CSF positive patients had some correlations. They were more anemic. They had a higher frequency of TET2 mutations, and they had a higher rate of bone marrow involvement. So yes, obviously surrogates for a more aggressive tumor disease biology, more tumor burden. I think at the end of the day, this is one of those findings that really changed our practice. Since that time, we and others have been instituting regular LPs with intrathecal chemo. I recommend eight. 
So two per cycle for the first four cycles, that's just for CNS prophylaxis. And then if actually positive, switching to the twice weekly regimen until you have several clear in a row, then once weekly for four, then back to the, the systematic approach. And the concept here is that almost none of our patients uh, have required radiation therapy if caught upfront and early. Obviously, if you have symptomatic CNS disease or persistent, now you've got to go to the radiation paradigm. But the concept here that it's so frequent in BPDC, and I really think it's anywhere from 20 to 30% probably of the patients, if we really check everyone, that I highly, strongly am really recommending all groups, please do regular LP intrathecal prophylaxis. I think we'll be able to save a lot of patients' lives by doing that together. So looking at the uh, contorsion hyper-CVAD regimen in a bit more detail, we wanted to see what were the outcomes, particularly setting a benchmark prior to the CD123 era. And among 35 patients treated, the CR rate was 80%. Median overall survival was better than the historical expectation at two years plus. And of course, again, just to emphasize again, there was the incorporation regularly of CNS to the uh, prophylaxis. Okay, so all this has led us to our current total triple therapy regimen here at MD Anderson on clinical trial, which is to give all of our best agents up front, uh, which includes alternating couplets, essentially doublets of a tag ven with hyper CVAD ven, age adjusted, of course, and kidney adjusted. It delivers regular lumbar puncture therapy, and the goal would be to see if we can somehow eliminate relapse, maybe even cure without uh, going to the allogeneic transplant. That's the hypothesis. That's the ongoing question that we're asking in this clinical trial. Speaking of allogeneic transplant, as in a lot of our aggressive malignancies, this appears to be a, a curative modality and an important part of the BPDCN patient's journey. Shown here is our first 17 patients together at the MD Anderson. And as you might expect, a very nice tail to the curve in patients who received allo transplant, particularly in CR1. But the caveat is the median age in this first 17 patients was young at 39. And so obviously the majority of our patients will be approximately double this age in the real world setting, comorbidities. And so other questions have come up, which is what about auto transplant and BPDCN? There have been some papers showing selected benefit, limited benefit. We still don't know allo versus auto. That's an ongoing question. And then two, as I mentioned to you, potentially investigating or exploring combination therapy up front to uh, improve outcomes without a transplant. So the uh, CD123 field is now moving nicely, five years post the approval of TAG monotherapy for BPDCN. This is just an example of some of the areas where CD123 targeted agents are being used, including maybe even in post-transplant BPDCN uh, monitoring and maintenance. And so what I would say is we have options now. In this rare disease that many uh, folks have been flummoxed by, I'm really proud of our worldwide, and it really has been a worldwide effort to try to come up with some options for our patients. And so depending on your location, your availability of drugs, I think we have something for you here. Uh, as we, just to summarize, in the frontline kind of standard of care setting, historically, cytotoxic chemo has proven to have a role, but mainly it's been the ALL-based regimens that I recommend the most. And if you can add venetoclax, say hyper CVAD ven you can expect an 80% plus overall response rate. Of course, you have to watch out for tumor lysis syndrome, infections, hospitalization. We have the CD123 drug now approved, TAG, as I showed you in the long-term setting in the JCO paper, three-year median overall follow-up, 75% ORR, 57% CRCRC, watch out for the capillary leak syndrome. I mentioned to you the Pavecumab sooner and IMGN promising in the clinical trials. Um, and so we await those results in progress. HMA VEN in the older unfit patients, LPs with intrathecal chemotherapy for all, allo transplant in CR1 for all who are eligible. If not, consider the auto transplant. Uh, and then if not, uh, then uh, a more of a consolidation long-term maintenance approach. For the future of the field across the world, as folks uh, are able to get a hold of the CD123 therapy, and of course, things like cost, availability, access, experience, monitoring for the capillary leak, all those must be part and parcel here. I can see a world where we're giving an upfront triplet combination as is being done in myeloma and AML, maybe a CD123 agent, BCL2 and chemo in the younger and fit, or in the older, more unfit CD123, BCL2 and possibly an HMA hypomethylating agent. Let's incorporate the new drugs as they come in, including 123 drugs, LPIT chemo for all still, and then developing a system for monitoring and understanding MRD 
um, so that we may be able to eliminate stem cell transplant at some point. Recurrent and future approaches in the relapse refractory setting, of course, that's tougher. We need to go and explore some of these uh, other modalities, look for other targets together, think more about the immunotherapies, CAR T, and, and other approaches. Some future directions in the field are intriguing. One is uh, this, which is a new entity kind of in between BPDCN and AML. That's called PDC AML or BPDCN like AML, still being postulated, hypothesized, theorized. Uh, there was a great report from uh, Dr. Ross Levine out of Sloan Kettering a few years ago, which I wrote the editorial for in Blood, which suggested that this is three to 5% of patients with AML. They have features of both BPDC and AML, including skin lesions. But the surprising and serendipitous interesting finding is that three fourths of these patients were RUNX1 mutated. RUNX1 is not a common one in BPDCN. Uh, and so these patients would have worse overall survival, increased skin lesions, an impaired PDC transcriptional program. And ultimately, the supposition in their in vitro and in vivo clinical preclinical modeling suggested that by giving the tag agent to this specific subgroup, you could have elimination of the PDCs and a decreased leukemic burden. So this is an intriguing uh, concept, and, and groups around the world are, are validating this. And I think it'll be interesting to see how we translate this into clinical trials. So based on all of this, I asked the question, is targeting the PDC easy at CD1, 2, 3? Unfortunately, the answer, I think, is no. I think that's the start. I think it's a great platform. But as I've mentioned to you here, you have to walk away from this talk knowing that I'm pleased that we've started the targeted therapy era, but I still think we need other components to make more of a total or triple therapy approach for this aggressive disease. Other special topics will include the exploration together of prior or concomitant hematologic malignancies. This rare disease continues to surprise us. I would say uh, a fifth to a quarter, so 20 to 25% of my patients are diagnosed with another blood cancer, either just before or at the same time as the BPDCN, it's remarkable. It's remarkable for a rare disease to see that. Most commonly, it's MDS, CMML, and we mentioned the shared TET2 origin. That's intriguing. But also, I've seen patients with TALL, MPNs, multiple myeloma, you name it. I think also the concept of CHIP leading into BPDCN is intriguing. We've published on that. And again, the TET2 story comes out there. So keep your eyes out for that. So when you diagnose BPDCN, be on the lookout for another heme malignancy and how does that affect your treatment, your counts recovery, CR versus CRH, very important concepts. Um, for the pediatric population out there, which I have a very high interest in, uh, given the rarity of this BPDCN, a lot of these calls come to me as well from around the world. This is important. First of all, we now know that BPDCN is much more common in the pediatric patient population than thought before. I think part of it is some of these cases were being signed out as AML with leukemia acutis, AML NOS maybe, and the language just hasn't been there for BPDCN until more recently, including peen path and derm path diagnoses. Nonetheless, we are seeing more cases of this. The TAG agent, as I mentioned, is actually approved in the U.S. ages two and older, but it's got us starting to collaborate with our pediatric colleagues all over the world, Dr. Gavorog, Dr. Bronco at MD Anderson. This is one case I'm showing you here of uh, a young patient um, who was treated in Lebanon in the relapse refractory setting uh, at age 10 to 11. And we were successfully able to uh, salvage with hyper advan and uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant. And so again, some of the concepts from the adult world will have some unique pediatric approaches uh, centered around this, and we're starting to form U.S., North American, and global consortiums to answer these questions. I think the role of social media is very important in any rare disease like our BPDCN. We have this hashtag BPDCN that me and my colleagues co-founded many years ago, and that's a nice way to follow us on Twitter. We're on LinkedIn. Uh, sources such as OncoDaily, started by Dr. Gavorg Tamamian and others on LinkedIn, I think is a powerful way to connect folks from the business, philanthropic, medical, patient care, all these worlds together, uh, blogs, just a lot more online about BPDCN than there was just five years ago. And then finally, I think the most one of the most positive developments has been what led to this uh, primer, this talk, to this global audience, which is the forming of these consortia. In addition to the North American BPDCN consortium that uh, Dr. Kantarjan and I founded a few years ago, uh, we're now collaborating with our pediatricians around the world stem cell transplant, dermatology, derm path, heme path, and AYA specialists. 
And uh, I mentioned to you this BPDCN International Registry led by Dr. Gavor Tamamian in Armenia with his colleagues, uh, along with the Immune Oncology Research Institute, uh, Dr. Voskananian. And I think this worldwide collaboration for BPDCN will lead us to do two things. One, to identify the unique patient characteristics of, around the world, because we've had cases of BPDCN all, all over the world, all the continents. And then two, to understand the unique outcomes, conditions, comorbidities, and treatment approaches. And I think we can really personalize and improve care all over the world. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention and thank all my collaborators at MD Anderson and around the world. Thank you all so much.